feel it only fitting that a woman start this. That's all right. <laughs> because for far too long, women have been relegated and punished because of what took place in the garden. This moment where a woman served as a gateway for sin to enter the world. And as she served as this gateway for sin to enter the world, one of the reasons why I love what happens in Genesis so much is that God doesn't allow the beginning to be her end as well. Because when God got ready to clean up the mess of the garden, he started it off with a woman who knew how to facilitate glory and the Holy Spirit. But when we go back to Genesis 3 and 13, when we initially see this woman in the garden, what we recognize is that when sin entered the world, it paved the way for ultimately what we know as Jesus coming to save us, our ultimate path of redemption. And while we often consider often how much or why Jesus got on the cross, I want to talk a little bit about the moment that required us to need a savior to begin with. Genesis 3 and 13 says, and the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. This text stands out in my mind because it helps me to understand that we don't just fall into sin. I wonder when God created man and woman and he gave the woman the charge of being fruitful and multiplying, if she recognized that in order to fulfill the mandate on her life, that she would literally have to face off with hell to get it done. We make it sound so simple, like why didn't she just deny the fruit? But the reality is that when sin enters our world, it's not so easy as just denying it because before we even engage in the action of sin, there is a deception that takes place in our mind. You see, the enemy isn't just after what you do, the enemy is after what you think. Because if the enemy can get your mind, he can change your actions. And we see his plan laid out in Genesis 3 in which he wants to distort our image of God. Did God really say? You didn't just sin. You didn't just mess up. You may have known better, but before you actually engaged with the action, there had to have been a deception in your mind. Some of us were born into the deception of other people's minds. That means before we even had an encounter with God, that we were born in a framework that made things okay that really weren't okay. And it wasn't until we had an encounter with God that we began to realize that I am going to have to be transformed by the renewing of my mind because I was born into sin. I was born thinking that it was okay to act this way. I was born thinking that retaliation was my only option. I was born thinking that it was okay to be angry and so often in church we make sin the big ones as long as we're not shacking and as long as you don't do this and that then you're living without sin but if we were honest in this room there were some of us who would be willing to admit that every single day I need saving I need saving from the way that I think I need saving from the way that I talk I need saving from this wretched mind of mine because I am wired to think against that which is good for me Sin is not just what you did before you got saved. Sin is what you're doing right now, trying to get your mind right. Some of us had to come to church today because I need to be in the presence of other people who are chasing after a renewed mind. I need to be in the midst of people who are trying to set their mind on things above because sometimes I set my mind on what happened in my past. And sometimes I set my mind on how worried I am in the future. Sometimes I set my mind on trying to control a situation instead of just letting go and letting God. Sinning is not just who you slept with and what you drank. Sinning is how you think about how God is showing up in your life. And the enemy says, if I can get your mind, then I can get your hands and I can get your feet. And all of a sudden you will be going against the very thing God called you to do. Eve doesn't just eat from the fruit. 
The serpent deceived me. That word deceived in the Hebrew means led astray. I was led astray before I did it. No one came and got me. I was led astray. Changed my mind and changed my path. I was led astray before I got here. And God is so good that even though in Genesis 2 he says that if you eat from this fruit, you will surely die. You would have thought that the moment she ate from the fruit that she would have collapsed and fell on the ground. But God is so God that he cannot lie about what he said. And so something has to die in order for his word to remain true. And that's when he covered them with the tunics of an animal. I feel like this is also a glimpse into grace. A glimpse into mercy where you don't actually get what you deserved covered. Not because you did everything the right way, not because you were obedient, you've been covered. There were some people in this room before you were even in relationship with God, you look back over your life and you see that God was covering you. I wasn't going to church, I wasn't praying, I wasn't trying to be righteous. I should be dead and out of my mind. I should be in somebody's grave. I should be locked up in jail. There's no reason why I should have this house. There's no reason why I should have these children, but I was covered in the midst of it all. I was covered some kind the way you covered me even when I didn't know I was covered you think your life was bad anyway you should have seen what it would have been had God lifted that covering off of you I know they betrayed you I know they walked away from you I know the family system was broken but if you think that's something you ought to see the plans the enemy actually had for your life you ought to see how he wanted to kill you and destroy you you ought to see how the cancer cells backed up off of you you ought to see how the x-ray machine showed what God said and not what was actually in your body. I've been covering you since you were a child. I've been covering you. Every step you took, I covered you. Don't let the fact that you saw the weapon make you think that the weapon actually prospered. Just because you saw it, it doesn't mean that it prospered because if you'd have known where it was really targeting, covered every step of the way we see God covering the man and the woman in the text but they're not reconciled because sometimes you can be covered but not yet reconciled what does it mean to be reconciled with God? It means that the division that sin created is standing in the way of you being made in the image of God. Sometimes we're covered, but we're misformed in our covering. I wish I could. Sin came and it changed your form. Anybody who would be willing to be honest in this room could admit that when I started sinning, it's not just that I did an action, it changed the way that I thought, it changed my form. No longer do I believe that I am the righteousness of God. No longer do I believe that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Now all of a sudden things I said I'd never do, I'm more open to because I'm not even the same person anymore because sin changed my form. And God says, I don't wanna just cover you, I gotta make sure that I get you back reconciled with me so that you can get out of the shape that the sin left you in. I don't know who needs to hear this, but I want you to know you don't have to stay in the same shape that that sin left you in. You don't have to stay in the same shape that that betrayal left you in. That's why we preach against bitterness and that's why we preach forgiveness, not because it's easy, but because unforgiveness changes your form. Shame changes your form. I don't know who you are, but I came to wage war against that shame because that shame Shame is changing your form, and God's got a mission in the earth that you can only accomplish if you get back in the form that you were in before sin ever said your name. Genesis 3 is when we first see that the blood covers, but the cross is where we see reconciliation. Because God, at the end of the day, just wants to be with you. 
by any means necessary. I just want to be with you. So when we see Isaiah 53 and 5, where it says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. We see an exchange that the blood is having an exchange with our iniquities. The blood is having an exchange with our transgressions. What I love so much about who God is and his wisdom in allowing us to have a savior is that he recognizes that as we go along this journey that there are going to be other things that try to have a say over who we are. But by sending his son to get on the cross, he tells us that at the end of the day, the blood is going to have the final say. Our role and job as believers is to trust that even when all hell is breaking out, that the blood is going to have the final say. I'm going to say that again for people on this side because I want you to know I don't know what you're facing right now. I don't know how much hell is breaking loose in your life. I don't know how much growth you need to accomplish or how much reconciliation you need in your heart. But I want you to know that the blood is going to have the final say. When I received Jesus as my Savior, I made a declaration to my circumstance that when it's all said and done, the blood is going to have the final say. That's why the doctor can say whatever they want to say because I know that the blood is going to have the final say. That's why the teachers can say whatever they want to say, because I know the blood ain't finished talking yet. When the blood is finished talking, then I'll finish talking. But all you saying right now is bumping your gums, because I recognize that my God's not finished showing up. The blood is going to have the final say over this marriage. The blood is going to have the final say over this ministry. The blood is going to have the final say over everything you touch. I know you're in the midst of the thickness right now. I know you're ready to give up right now, but I want you to know that you can't give up until the blood is finished speaking. I met a woman once and they diagnosed her with cancer and they told her she had a short amount of time to live. And she came back and she told me, they told me my time was short, but they didn't realize that if I live, I'm gonna be okay. And if I die, I'm still gonna be okay because the blood has the final say. You can't threaten me with death because I know that the blood is gonna have the final say. You can't threaten me with betrayal because I know that the blood is gonna have the final say. And because of the blood, I've been restored. Because of the blood, I don't look like what I went through because of the blood that he shed on Calvary I can prophesy I can decree a thing in the earth because of the blood demons tremble when I wake up in the morning when I was waking up in my own strength nothing would happen but when I say I plead the blood of Jesus over my house I plead the blood of Jesus over my children I make a declaration to hell hell I see you but the blood ain't finished talking The blood, 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 no, the cancer, no, the blood, no issues, the blood, abuse, no, the blood, molestation, no, the blood, abortion, no, the blood, murder, no, the blood, the blood, the blood's not finished speaking. And every now and then, we need a reminder that the blood still works. I go to therapy, therapy works. But when I can't get through to my therapist, sometimes all I can do is plead the blood. Sometimes I don't have the word, all I have is the blood. Sometimes I don't have the money, all I have is the blood. And I wish I could make it, sense, make it make sense to you. But sometimes you gotta experience the blood for it to make sense to you. I don't have time to convince an atheist about the blood. All I can tell you is I once was lost, but now I'm found. All I can tell you is I shouldn't be here, but I started pleading the blood. All I know is something happens when I say the name Jesus. All I know is that demons started running out of my life and depression had to let me go. All I said was the blood, the blood, the blood. Oh. 
and the blood still works. And I don't care who's coming to church or who's fading away. As for me and my house, we plead the blood of Jesus. I'm gonna plead the blood with war. I'm gonna plead the blood in a recession. I'm not gonna let you get on the cross and I forget that I got another option. I'm not gonna let you go and go to the cross for me to forget. When Jesus gets on the cross, he knows that sin has an assignment to kill, steal, destroy, and separate you. Even right now, that's why we can't play with sin. Because sin is on an assignment. And it starts off subtly. And then all of a sudden, you're someone you never thought you would be because it starts off so subtly that it deceives you. It seduces your mind and leads you astray. Sin is on an assignment. It's not just one night. It's not just one lie. It is the beginning of what will be your destruction because sin is on an assignment. But Jesus gets on the cross because the blood is on assignment too. The blood is on assignment too. I said the blood is on assignment too. I said the blood is on assignment too. I know you see how the enemy is showing up in your life, but I came here to let you know that the blood is on assignment too. The blood's not finished. But it costs something to get on the cross. I grew up in church. I spent most of my life just looking at the kingship of who Jesus is, his divinity, his power. But it cost the human side of Jesus to get on the cross and be wounded for something he didn't do. To say, put the sins of the world in this holy body. I'll pay the price so you don't have to. I'll give him another chance because I am so in love with who you could be that I don't care who you have been. How could you not give up on me? We're not talking about someone who just saw what was happening in that present moment. We're talking about someone who could see into the future and understand that that blood wasn't just covering who came before, but the blood is going to go and cover who is yet to come. We often talk about when he's on the cross, wounded, bleeding. For us, he says, it is finished. What's, what's finished? Sin's reign, death's reign, that shame, that pain, that abuse, that depression is finished. It's finished. It took everything he had. But it's finished, and I think we do this sacrifice a great disservice when we live like it's not finished. I don't know what you're up against. I don't know what feels like it's still open in your world. But I want you to know that heaven has a perspective, and that is that it is finished. That sin, that issue, that struggle, that pain, that memory is finished. Thank God for Jesus. That this is not an open case. Because when it's all said and done, the blood had the final say over my life. 
And if it had the final say over my life back then, it can have the final say over my life right now. The crucifixion is the moment where everything that limited us, that bound us, came to an end. But what an expensive finish it was for him to end it for us meant he had to take on something that didn't belong to him. One of the things that amazed me about Jesus was how sold out he was. He, he was. he was sold out. Holy Week for me is an opportunity to stare at Jesus afresh. Because there's something in the life and the ministry of Jesus that is designed to be a mirror to me. He, 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 he was the firstborn among many brethren. So when I, when I look at Jesus, I don't just look at what he did in a way that is isolated from who I am called to be. Are, are you hearing me? The Bible speaks of transformation. You know, there's a theological term that you scholars know called sanctification. You've got salvation, which is actually not necessarily an ending. It's really a beginning. We, we get saved so that we can become so that we can go through the process of sanctification. And uh, that process oftentimes involves us becoming like Jesus. So, so I stare at Jesus often. And one of the things that stands out to me about Jesus was his mentality. His mentality, he was radically sold out. I, I mean like, like sold out, sold out. You, you understand what I'm saying? I, I mean, I mean like, like, like he was surrendered, very, very deeply submitted and surrendered. In fact, Paul says, since we're talking about mentality, if you want to get this right, in Philippians 2 he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, right? Allow this mind, let this mind. He also says in Romans 12, we're transformed by the renewing of our. And he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And he begins to talk about what that looks like, right? In fact, let's look at it real quick. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. I'm in Philippians 2, beginning at verse 5. It says, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. But rather, it says, he made himself of no reputation. Wow. The humility. But, but watch it. He made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man. So him coming in the likeness of man was one level, the first level of his submission. Are, are you hearing me? In other words, to not be God, which it wouldn't be robbery for him to not be who he is. He had every right to be God because he was God. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So he had a right, Pastor Joel, Dr. Joel, he had a right to be God. It was not robbery. It says yet for surrender's sake, for submission, submission to submit to a mission. For submission's sake, he takes on the likeness of a man. He agrees, watch this, he agrees with the Father 
to become temporarily for a mission less than who he was. And yet the Bible says, let this mind not just be in him, but be in you. But it goes further. It says he makes himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. Then this is very interesting. It says, and being found in appearance as a man. So he agrees to it. I feel the Holy Ghost here. He agrees to it, but he still has to experience what he's agreed to. Come on, somebody. So he agrees, he says yes to God. He's given God an open-ended yes. And now he finds himself in the appearance as a man. See, sometimes for us, we say yes. Hey, but, but when the reality of what we say yes to shows up, sometimes we get spiritual amnesia. Uh, Lord, I do not know oh, you didn't really say. Did God really say? We start talking like Satan. Did God really say? Because at that moment, it requires another level of submission. Are we tracking? So it says, and being found in appearance as a man, watch this, what does he do? He humbles himself. Watch this. He has to now submit to and fit into the space that his yes assigned for him. To humble himself, he has to become, watch this, he has to become smaller now. And on, and on, and on. Let's keep reading, let's keep reading. And, and, and he, he humbles himself, and not only that, he becomes, here's another level, obedient to the point of death. Watch this, another level, even the death of the cross. Look at all of these successive levels of submission and surrendering and the Bible says let this same mind not simply be in him but be in you and so I learned something about surrender surrender is not the same as obedience I, I thought I thought until I begin to stare at Jesus I thought that surrender and obedience are the same thing, but they are not. Here's the difference. Obedience is to obey an instruction. So if you obey an instruction, you were obedient in that moment. Surrender, however, watch this, this is important, is to relinquish your right to control your life and circumstances and to place that governance under the authority of God, no matter the request. You see the difference? So, so when, when we talk about surrender, we're talking about a posture. A posture of, of at the ready. This isn't a case by case thing. Come on, because you could be obedient in one area or in one instruction, but not be obedient in the next. This was the issue with the rich young ruler. You know the story, Mark 10, study it when you get a chance. The rich young ruler, he goes to Jesus and he says, hey, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus is a master. Jesus says, well, don't do this and don't do this, obey this and obey that and so on and so forth. And he was like, yes, I've done all these things have been obedient to all these things. And in Jesus, the Bible says Jesus looking at him. <laughs> I love that Jesus can look at you deeply and identify the area in your life that you might be trying to fake it until you make it, but we serve a Jesus that don't play no games. He doesn't deal with the ideal you. He deals with the real you. And I love that. I want a real Jesus because I want a real transformation. I want a real transformation. So Jesus now, watch this. Looking at him says, yep, but there is one thing you lack. He says, sell everything you have, take the resources, give it to the poor, watch this, and 
follow me. In other words, be surrendered and submitted to me. And homeboy walks away sad. Even though he was obedient, he was not surrendered. Abraham is another story. Because not only was Abraham obedient, hey, he was also surrendered. How do you know? What are you talking about? Well, well, well. Abraham believed that he was obedient and he ultimately produced Isaac. And watch this. Isaac, mm -hmm, watch this, was not the fullness of the promise. <laughs> You're not ready. Isaac wasn't the full, because the fulfillment of the promise would have necessitated things to happen beyond Isaac. Obedience got him Isaac. Him being surrendered, as was demonstrated on Mount Moriah, is when God said, oh, blessings, I will bless you. Multiplying, I will multiply you. And I'm going to do all these things that I promised. Watch this. Because you would not withhold even your only son. Obedience didn't get him the promise. That surrendered spirit got him the promise. And the Bible says, let this same mind be in us. Jesus is a radical surrender. Even on the cross, it's hard for me to believe that all that Jesus went through, all of the surrendering that he did, all of the submitting that he did, all of the obedience that he did, even up to Calvary, and dying on Calvary. And the truth is, and you have to stare closely to see this. The truth is, even on Calvary, he still wasn't finished surrendering. Oh, you're not ready. You say, PT, what you talking about? That's a strange doctrine. Didn't he say it is finished? Wasn't it is finished his last words? No. No. In order to understand everything that Jesus is saying, Pastor Sarah referenced the seven last sayings, right? In order to get the seven last sayings, you have to read all of the Gospels. There are no seven sayings in one Gospel. In order to get them, there's two here, one there, three there. In order to get all that Jesus said, you have to read all of the Gospels. The last thing that Jesus said was not, it is finished. It was, Father, into my hands, into your hands, I commit my spirit, even on his way out. He is surrendering. Can we go deeper? Can we go a little further? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The work of the cross. So what was finished? What was finished was, watch this, his work on the cross. The work that needed to be carried out in his body. The work of the cross was finished, but he wasn't. Y'all not ready? The mission, the mission above earth was completed. But there was still an assignment beneath earth that had to be accomplished. And watch this. He has to now take on another form in order to achieve it. Are you hearing me? And it can be argued that this form was an unknown form because I found myself in appearance as a man. So, so, so that was a revelation. That was a new thing. Now I've got to go, watch this. 
I've got to become something that I haven't become before. And I've got to go somewhere that I've never been before. And I've got to close my eyes and trust. Hallelujah. I've got to trust that God is going to see me through this. I have to, Father, into your hands. I commit my spirit for the next level of my assignment. Because my assignment was not simply the prophecy over my life, was not simply Isaiah 53. There was also another promise over my life that's found in Psalm 16 and 10. And that promise says, prophecy says, for you, will un, you, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. So there was a prophecy over his life that yes, he has to go to the cross, but when he gets finished with that assignment, he's got another assignment. He has got to go to Sheol. Can we talk about Sheol just for a minute? Sheol, Hades, the world of the dead, hell, sorrowful, terrifying, hopeless, dark, the underworld, the grave, the pit. It was the designation for the abode of the dead, nothing living there. It was the place of no return. Without the praise of God, the wicked were sent there for punishment. Hallelujah. It was the place of exile. Watch this. A place of extreme degradation in sin. And now the Holy One has to go there. So when David says in Psalm 23... Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death and I will fear no evil, he is prophesying what Jesus would later have to say to himself. Yea, though I walk through the valley, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit for this next leg of the race. See, what I love about Jesus is he is a go-all-the-way Jesus. I love the tenacity of Jesus. I, I love the fact that he saves to the uttermost. He don't just save a little. He don't just heal a little. He don't just deliver a little. Jesus saves to the uttermost. I've got to land this plane. So, so... So what did he go, what did he have to do in Sheol? What did he go there for? Three things primarily. The first thing that he had to do, the first reason he had to go was he had an announcement to make. Oh death, where is your sting? <laughs> oh Hades. Where's your victory? The sting of death was sin. Come on, somebody. And the strength of sin was the law. He had an announcement to make, but thanks be to God. See, you can have something, but it isn't until you announce it to principalities and powers. It isn't until you speak it over that thing that you experience it. He had to go preach to some dead folk, right? John 5, 28, it says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice. He had work to do. Even in Hosea, the prophecy, when Paul quotes that, Oh, death, where is your sting? From 1 Corinthians 15, he is prophesying, he's pulling from an Old Testament prophecy in Hosea saying, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. Oh, death, I will be your plagues. Oh, grave, I will be your destruction. He had an announcement to make. That's the first thing. The second thing was, why did he go to Sheol? He had some keys to claim. Hey! 
There, there were some keys that belonged to him. I feel the spirit of God in this place. See, he was giving out keys when he did ministry. He told Peter, uh, you know, I, I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. He had those keys to give. The keys that he did not yet have the keys to give were the keys to hell and death. I got to tie this up. He has some keys to get. Mm. Revelation 1.18, he says, I am he who lives and was dead, and, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. Oh, by the way, and I have the keys. Of hell and death. We got to move. And the third thing, caveat. Every time you surrender to God, every time you obey God radically, God will give you a key. Feel the Holy Ghost. He'll give you access. I feel this. Some of you are trying to get into doors and I hear God saying, submit to me, baby. If you learn how to submit to me, I will fill your key rings with keys of favor and access. Oh, I feel God. The Bible says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. I don't care about the industry. I don't care about the need. I don't care what it is. If you need keys to open up something that has been locked to you, you better learn how to surrender, baby. We got to go. We got to go. He had an announcement to make. He had keys to claim. Here's the last one. He had a raid to execute. <laughs> Hallelujah. He had a raid to execute. Ephesians 4, 7 through 13, it says, but to each, of, to, to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he, watched this, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. He, he led captivity captive. He, he led captivity captive. He, he took what was captive and keeping me captive, and he took it and made it made it captive uh-huh it may look like you are surrounded but god is surrounding what is surrounding you you ain't surrounded what is surrounding you is actually surrounded hallelujah open my eyes lord open my eyes pastor don it says that he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now, in case you don't, you know, just so that we're on the same page, verse 9 it says, now this, he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first descended. He went down first. Sometimes down is the way up, family. Come on, somebody. He descended. Uh-huh. Into the lower parts of the earth. That's Sheol. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above. And we'll get to that. And it says, so, so, and he gives, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers for the equipment of saying, study it. When you get a chance, get it. Check this out. When he descends, he takes the authority that was legitimately Satan's, Justin. Satan got it honest. Yeah, no, the Bible says he is the ruler of this world. He was. He was the ruler of this world. Jesus came to cast out the ruler of this world, but he was legitimately the ruler. He had power. But Jesus goes into the earth and he performs a raid. You remember that song, I'm going into the enemy's camp to take back what the enemy stole? That's what he did. So when he descended, he took the authority, watch this, from Satan's camp and he gave it to the camp of the kingdom. Do you see it? He led captivity captive, got the spoil, got the power, got the anointing, got the authority, and said, oh, let me sling it at my people, and I'm going to take that power, and I'm going to anoint some people to be apostles. Come on, somebody. Prophets, evangelists, 
pastors, teachers. Power exchange. He raided hell. I ain't gonna lie. I used to be a hell raiser. Not no more. Now I'm a hell raider. While Jesus was raiding hell, the disciples were living in an utter hell unimaginable. The unthinkable had happened. The one who was holy was treated as if he was incorrigible. The one who they had given up their livelihoods and their jobs and their families and their friends just to walk in his shadow was gone. The trauma of this moment is so overwhelming that I want to argue with you, my brothers and sisters, that not only was Jesus buried, but the disciples were buried too. For the Bible said that they were shut up behind closed doors for fear of the Jews. Now I've got a Jesus that is shut up and a church that is shut up. And if he does not get up, Paul said, if Christ be not risen from the dead, we are of all men most miserable because he was not the only one that was in the grave. Everybody that followed him was shut up to. Boundness begets boundness. Once you understand that, you change your friends because if you run around with bound friends, you're going to be bound to. If you hang around bound preachers, you're going to be bound to because being bound is contagious. That's why Abram had to put out Hagar because being bound is contagious. And if your mama's bound, the world would have you say, then the child Ishmael will be bound. Put out the bond woman and her son. If bondness begets boundness, then freedom begets freedom. The trauma of this moment is perplexing because though there were many, many, many people who were crucified before Jesus, the Romans had mastered the art of crucifixion. They had been taught by the Assyrian and the Phoenicians to practice of crucifixion right down to minute detail that the victim, once he was picked out, would carry the T of the cross upon his shoulders after he had been lacerated and beaten until the Bible says his insides were hanging out. And there was no beauty about him that we should desire him. And after this humiliating experience of being stripped in front of his followers, he had to carry the cross. And the Romans were masterful at this. It was not an odd thing to see a cross in Jerusalem. For years they had seen crosses in Jerusalem because a cross was what the terrorists used to control the Jews. 
The Romans used crosses and lifted them up high so that every mother walking her child to school could see a dead person hanging from a cross as a sign, don't fool with Rome. It was the same things that the slave masters used when they left bodies hanging from the trees and somebody called it strange fruit because when the fruit grows strange on the tree, the people grow quiet in the house and the devil wants to shut you up. That's all the trouble is about. He's trying to shut your mouth. He doesn't need your car. He doesn't need your career. He doesn't need your house. He doesn't need your children. All he's doing is using a tool to shut your mouth. But somebody in this room has made up in their mind, I will not shut up. Be shut down, but I won't shut up. I may be tied down, but I won't shut up. I may be broke. I will not, 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 I will not shut up. was not just that he died. People had been dying since Cain killed Abel. Thousands of generations of people had all been born and died. It was not that he'd been buried because all men who die are buried. But the peril breaks out is if he doesn't get back up again, then he is no different from anybody else. And we have no gospel to preach and let the choir leave the choir stand and the dancers stop dancing because if Christ is not risen from the dead, we don't have no good news. It is not even that he is the first one to be resurrected. There are others who have been resurrected. He himself had resurrected Jairus' daughter from the grave. He had stopped the widow of Nain and just touched the casket and the dead boy got up. Even Elijah had raised the Sunamite woman's son from the grave and Elisha had raised a woman's son from the grave. That had all been done before even Lazarus. The Bible said Jesus went to the grave of Lazarus. Didn't even go in. Didn't even lay hands on him just stood in front of the grave and said, roll the stone away. And Lazarus came leaping up out of the grave. He might have been bound, but he was still leaping. I wonder if there's anybody in here. You might be bound, but you still got to leap down in here. So they went through the horrible trauma of waiting. Waiting is all right if you don't need something. But when you are waiting on something, 
Not that you want, not that you saw on TV, not that you scrolled over on Instagram, but when you are waiting on something that you need, it's torment. It is the tactic of the terrorist to leave you waiting on something that you need. This message comes to someone who is waiting on something that you absolutely need. Test three people and say, I need it, I need it. It ain't just that I want it, I need it, I need it. I can't be happy without it, I can't live, I can't smile. I need it, I need it, I need it. And still God has me waiting. They that wait upon the Lord. Shall renew their strength, but Judas didn't renew his strength. He hung himself till his bowels spilled out in what they call the potter's field. He is the broken pot that was in the master's hand but never got mended. Isn't it a terrible thing to be so close and yet be so far? Wouldn't it be a terrible thing to be so close as to come on Easter Sunday and yet be so far. There is no book of Romans. There is no book of Ephesians. There is no Thessalonica, first nor second. There is no book of Romans or Hebrews or the epistles of 1 Peter or 2 Peter or 1 Timothy or 2 Timothy or Jude or Philemon or Revelation, none of it. It will be written almost 60 years later. So they had to believe with no Bible. They had to believe without the benefit you have of being on this side of the cross. They are on the back side of the miracle. Somebody in this room right now, you're having to believe something that you have no point of reference for. And yet you got stubborn faith that said, I've never seen it done before, but I still believe that God is able. If I'm talking about you, holler at me like you are fun. <clears throat> yeah, holler at me like you don't care what nobody thinks. Holler at me like you in a fight with the devil and you got a wind coming hell or high water. They waited. They waited and waited. Oh, I feel like preaching now. They waited and waited. They waited, they waited all night Friday and nothing happened. They waited and waited and waited. Maybe something would happen Saturday morning. They waited all day Saturday morning and still no news. It was getting dark Saturday night and still no news. The Sabbath was over and still no news. But early, early Sunday morning <laughs> he got up sting out of death and the victory of the grave and said I am he that was dead I'm alive I'm alive 
seen the Syrian soldier come to life. <laughs> I've seen Jay Iris' daughter come to life. I've seen Lazarus come to life. But what confused me was Lazarus was alive but he couldn't get loose. It took all the disciples to loose him and let him go. So I want to ask you this question. Who loses Jesus? When your God gets ready to bring you out, no devil in hell can hold him back. Somebody shake yourself like you're about to be loosed. Shake yourself. I refuse to stay in this bar. Shake yourself. I refuse to give up my dream. Shake yourself. Shake yourself. Shake your mind. Shake your heart. Shake your body. Shake. 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 Yeah. Yeah, and if you got real crazy faith, I mean crazy faith, and you don't care what nobody thinks, and you've been pressed down for a long time, slap seven people and tell them I'm coming out of this. I decree and declare this Easter Sunday morning, I'm coming out of my grave clothes. I'm coming out of my guilt. I'm coming out of my depression. I'm coming out of my loneliness. I'm coming out of my despair. I'm coming out of my attack. I gotta stop. But if I had time, I'd show you how he went in as the Lamb of God. And when he rose from the dead, he didn't have nothing to wear. So he put on a gardener's suit because he is the seed of Abraham. He is the lily of the valley. He is the bright and morning star. He is the rose of Sharon. And so he can sow some seeds on you. He put on a gardener's outfit. Folded up the death napkin. Neat about it. Walked out of the grave and showed himself alive so that you Could be free. <laughs> the grave clothes that they put on dead people, I studied it out. They took one inch strips of linen and wrapped it like gauze around the body. It was how they entombed them. The reason Lazarus had to jump 
is that he was awake, but he was still in the cast. It is possible to be awake and still have the grave clothes of doubt and fear and depression and loneliness and lust and craving and codependency wrapped all around you. And the worst part of it is beneath all of that mess on you, you're alive. If you weren't dead, it wouldn't bother you. But the sign that you are alive is that what used to make you happy gets on your nerves. See, grave clothes were not made for living people. And the reason you're so uncomfortable is that you are too alive to live so dead. <laughs> so when, when Lazarus got up, Jesus asked the disciples to loose him and let him go. When Jesus got up, he didn't have nobody to ask but himself. But he loosed himself. <laughs> Woo! Dr. Jane, he loosed himself! And just to let hell know that he wasn't in a hurry, folded the death net. <laughs> Ain't he bad? <laughs> And the Bible said that there was an angel standing on each side of the tomb. And all of a sudden we understood what the Ark of the Covenant was. That when the angels faced off, they were prophesying where Jesus was going to get up. Do you know the angels of the Lord encamp around you right now? And there is, hear me good. Everybody stand. There is literally nothing wrapped around you. Your mind, your heart, your thoughts. Your children or like thereof. Your emptiness, your loneliness. You don't have to be further terrorized. Yes. 